in our solar system. So we have, first of all, the four inner terrestrial or rocky planets, so Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And, you know, they're classified um, all the same because they have hard, rocky surfaces. You know, they don't have very big atmospheres. Um, they'll have kind of metallic cores and then surrounded by a layer of kind of silica rock and then and then a crust. Broadly speaking, they're all really similar. We refer to these as the terrestrial or rocky planets. Moving out then into the deeper parts of the solar system, further away from the sun, we have um, the Jovian or gas giants. And I will point out at this stage that these images are not to scale. So these planets are sort of displayed here just so that we can see what they look like. They are by far not, not to scale at all. And the Jovian or gas giants, as their name suggests, they are massive, they are enormous, much, much bigger than the terrestrial or rocky planets, and they are comprised mostly of gas. So they have very thick atmospheres, um, Jupiter and Saturn by mass and 90% hydrogen and helium. And then deep down in their centres, they'll have sort of metallic rocky cores, but significantly smaller than the rest of them. Then for a long time, Uranus and Neptune, they were kind of lumped in with uh, Jupiter and Saturn as gas giants. But as time went on, we realised that actually they are very different to Jupiter and Saturn. And we now refer to them as the ice giants. And although they do have substantial atmospheres compared to the ter terrestrial or rocky planets, you're know, much thicker, they're actually not, there's not much of them that's made of hydrogen and helium. Uh, by mass, Uranus and Neptune are only about 20% hydrogen and helium compared to Jupiter and Saturn's 90%. And beneath their kind of com comparatively thick hydrogen helium atmospheres, they're kind of made of this icy slush of things like water ice, ammonia, it's an exotic, what we call a superfluid, because of the enormous pressures inside these planets. And they are the planets of our solar system. And you can see lots of different things going on, lots of different types. Exoplanets are no different. We have lots of different types of exoplanets. Some of them are quite familiar. So we have terrestrial and rocky exoplanets, which are, you know, reasonably similar to the Earth. They have a solid surface. They are generally up to about twice the size of Earth. That's the sort of cutoff point for terrestrial rocky exoplanets. And they may or may not have an atmosphere. So Venus has a very thick atmosphere in our solar system. Earth has a substantial atmosphere, but you know, Mars has a, has a very thin atmosphere. Mercury doesn't really have one at all. But all of those would sort of be lumped under the terrestrial rocky planets. And then we find with exoplanets, we have types which don't exist in our solar system. There are no counterparts. So one of these are super Earths or mini Neptunes. They have two names, but they are one and the same. So these are planets which are bigger than Earth, hence the super Earth, uh, but they are small. Oh, now I don't know if my internet's just dropped. You, yeah, yeah okay. you did just freeze for a second. <laughs> yeah, I just I just saw out the corner of my eye. Okay, so I'll, I'll just recap the very last thing I said because I wasn't sure if it came through. Um, so okay, I think I'm back. Yes, okay. So um, yeah, they are bigger, bigger than Earth, so um, hence the super Earth, but they are also smaller than Neptune, um, hence the mini Neptunes. So there's a picture here at the bottom, which is a two scale image of Neptune, which is the big blue one, and then Earth on the, on the left here. So this kind of gives you an indication of the size of the planets that we're talking about. And these ones, while they might be anywhere between Earth and Neptune, in the sense of they might be quite rocky, like the Earth, um, and have a, a small atmosphere, or they actually might be a, a sort of mini gas planet, so with very substantial atmospheres, so more kind of... I think my internet's dropped again. Okay. No, you, you were okay. Okay, all right. Uh, so more kind of towards the, the Neptune end of things. And then with, within sort of Super Earth's mini Neptune's rocky planets, we have other categories which kind of describe what conditions are like on the surface. So we might have ocean planets, 
where they are completely covered in water or we might have desert planets so more like Mars where there's no water on the surface at all. We can then think about gas giants so we have found lots of gas giants exoplanets these are you know as the name suggests giants generally their mass is over 10 times that of earth um, they will have a like, small rocky core, mostly gas, you know, hydrogen and helium. So we're thinking very much along the lines of kind of Jupiter and Saturn. But within gas giants, we find a type of planet which we simply don't have in our solar system. And these are hot Jupiters. And these are extraordinary planets. Um, they're really interesting. And these are gas giant planets that orbit incredibly close to their parent star. So their orbits might take just a few days. Now we can compare that to our solar system. Mercury's orbit is 88 days. So, you know, it's, it's really extraordinarily close to their parent star. And then within the gas giants, again, we have things which are more like Neptune. So more like Uranus, they'll have, you know, rocky metallic cores, less substantial atmospheres, but reasonably substantial. But the first sort of consideration of exoplanets, even though we now know so much about all the different types of planets that exist, you know, this is a very modern thinking. This is the last sort of 30 years that this field has really sort of explodes into life. And for our first kind of considerations of are there planets elsewhere, we have to go back to this guy, Giordano Bruno, all the way back in the 16th century. Now, um, back in the 16th century, you couldn't just be an, an astronomer, right? It was almost like if you were an astronomer, that was your side gig. So he was a philosopher, um, he was a mathematician, and for good measure, he was also an occultist, because why not? But he um, came up with some very interesting ideas. He had infinite universe theories, which is very different to the thinking of the time. He actually rejected geocentric astronomy. So geocentric astronomy is um, when you consider that the Earth is at the centre of the universe and everything else revolves around it. So the sun goes around the Earth and all the planets go around the Earth. So he rejected that idea, didn't think that that was right. And he gives us really the first known written mention of exoplanets in his book. And I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this. And I do apologise if there is anyone Italian listening. But his book, uh, Dile Infinito Universo in Mondi. And in that book, he writes, there are infinite worlds similar to this one and no different from it in its type, because there is no reason by which, just as they exist in this space that surrounds us, Jenny, Am I still here? Yeah, you just froze for a second. Yeah, that's, that's fine. You guys can, can read the, the screen as well. So I'll just continue with the second paragraph. So he says, there are therefore innumerable suns. There are infinite earths that equally revolve around these suns in the same way as we see these seven revolve around this sun that is close to us. So this is really forward thinking. He's kind of saying, well, actually, I think there are, you know, these dots in the sky are just like the sun and the sun's got planets. So why can't all these dots have planets too? But, you know, these ideas, a li little bit too forward thinking for the times. And he was declared a heretic and unfortunately burned at the stake. As, as was the way in the 16th century for anything that was, you know, daring to be modern. For our next consideration of exoplanets, we actually have to jump forward to the 17th century with Sir Isaac Newton of, you know, the Apple and Telescope fame. And in his Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, he says, and if the fixed stars are the centres of similar systems, they will all be constructed according to a similar design. And what he's saying there is, just like Giordano Bruno was saying, is if the stars are suns, when the sun has planets, well, they're all going to have planets as well. And that is kind of where we sit for a very long time in terms of the history of kind of exoplanets. It was musings. The next leap forward, we have to jump to 1963. So, you know, a couple of centuries where we're moving forward now, or three centuries, really. And we are going to a... We, 
There you're back. (laughs) And we are going to a meeting of the American Astronomical Society with this guy, Peter Van der Kamp. And he made planet orbiting Barnard Star. Now Barnard Star is a relatively nearby star, it's about six light years away, um, and it's a, a red dwarf star, so a star that's smaller than the sun. And he was making this claim based on data that sort of spanned 50 years, and it came from a 24-inch telescope, and he's claiming that this was a planet because it had, by his estimates, a mass of about one and a half times that of Jupiter's. Now prior to this, Peter had made um, some other claims that he had found planets around other stars, but the masses of these so-called planets kind of put them on the boundary of are they a planet, are they a star, a companion star as it were. So they were kind of dismissed, but this one at one and a half times but this one at one and a half times Jupiter's mass, that is decidedly planet-like. However, some shadows were kind of cast on uh, Peter van der Kamp's claims, uh, most notably by this guy, John L. Hershey, not of the, the Hershey chocolate, as far as I can work out. And he wasn't sure that the data that was being used was very reliable. And so he and Wolf Dieter Heights, they re- came to the unfortunate So he and Wolf Dieter Heights came to the unfortunate conclusion that the so-called exoplanet was not an exoplanet. It was actually just problems with the data. So the way Peter van der Kamp claimed he had discovered this planet was by um, very carefully tracking the motion of this star across the sky. And he claims that he could see this star wobbling about in images. And that was caused by the planet orbiting it, tugging on the star. But actually, um, during the period of time from which his data was taken, um, modifications were made to the telescope. They changed out the lenses and this actually shifted slightly the whole optic system. And that slight shift in the optic system made it look like the star was moving. So it wasn't actually a planet at all. It was just unfortunate machinery changes. But if you have a look at Barnard's star today, it does have exoplanets, but they are significantly smaller than what Peter van der Kamp was claiming and would never have sort of been detectable with the technology at that time. But our first detection of natural planets from 1990 was Dale Frail. And they found an exoplanet within an extraordinary area of star. Now, the whole star is a uh, uh, remnant of a star, star that has died, died in a while and there's no no explosion. So massive stars get to the end of their life, they don't kind of quietly fade away and puff off their outer layers like our sun will. No, they die in a very dramatic explosion where gravity finally gets the upper hand when they run out of fuel. They collapse down and then rebound out in this enormous explosion. And as the star is kind of collapsing down in its center, one of two things really happens. Either the star is kind of of a middling size and it will crush down and it'll be able to form a neutron star. Or if it's very massive indeed, then that collapse can't be stopped by anything and it will go on to form a black hole. Now, pulsars, they have extraordinarily strong magnetic fields. They also rotate hundreds of times a second. And we don't exactly know how, but a combination of this very rapid rotation and these extraordinarily strong magnetic fields drives these amazing beams of radiation as charged particles are sort of funneled along these magnetic field lines. They create all this light. And it's funneled out in two beams. And when these radiation beams sweep across us, like in the animation, we get this very, very regular sort of beep, beep, beep of light. And this is so regular, this sort of repeating pattern, that for a long time, atomic clocks were sort of set by pulsars. And when you have an exoplanet that's orbiting a a pulsar, it, because it's tugging on the star as it's orbiting, you know, there's equal and opposite reactions. The star is exerting a gravitational force on the planet to keep it in orbit. And then the planet exerts a force back on the star. 
otherwise it would just be sucked straight into the star. And as this planet is tugging on this star, it causes it to wobble. And that means that these pulses of radiation we get, they're not as, they're not as regular as they should be. And these irregularities betray a presence of an exoplanet. And that is how the first one was found. So this is on the left, an artist's impression of what an exoplanet orbiting a pulsar might sort of see, what it might kind of look like. In terms of planets around a sun-like star, that took another three years. So it's a, you know, it's a long time, really. We go into 1995, Michel Mayer and Didier Kalos, here they are. And they were the first to find an exoplanet orbiting a sun-like star, and that was 51 Pegasi b. And whenever I talk about these guys, I always have to show this image. This is the image of Michel Mayer when he found out that he was winning the Nobel Prize in 2019. He shared it with Didier and another physicist. And he's actually on a lecture tour. And this is just in a canteen. And he sat there at his laptop watching all the messages come in of him congratulating him for winning the Nobel Prize. And I think it is just so typical that an astronomer would just be sat in a cafe when they find out they've won one of the highest prizes in their field of all time. It's a spectacular image, and I'm so glad that someone managed to capture that moment. So from 1995 to now, 2021, we have discovered a hell of a lot more exoplanets. So we are now at 4,516 confirmed as of yesterday. So the number might have gone up today, but I updated the slide yesterday and that's where we are. And we've got another 7,700 that are just waiting to be confirmed. So it's an extraordinary number. And um, I've got a plot here and I know plots can, can be intimidating, but this one is just to kind of illustrate some things about the sort of exoplanets that we found. Now, the different colors and shapes denote the way that these planets were found. And then on the x-axis of this plot, we've got period. So um, that's how long the planet takes to orbit its star. So, um, and then on the y-axis here, we've got the mass compared to Jupiter. So here would be sort of one, one Jupiter mass here, going smaller, going up. And this is a log-log scale. So I just want to highlight that. Am I back? You're back. I'm back. Okay. So every time we jump to a point on this axis, we're not sort of going 10, 20, 30. We're jumping up by an order of magnitude. So we're going 1, 10, 100, 1,000. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of numbers kind of crammed into this very small scale. And it's the same here. Now, if we have a look at the green squares, this is exoplanets discovered using the transit method. By far our most prolific way of discovering exoplanets so far. And we can see that, you know, they, there's a trend with the sort of planets that this method finds. It's very good at finding planets orbiting close to its star. We can see a peak here of around eight days or so and massive planets around the mass of Jupiter. We've got lots of points kind of clustered here, whereas the radial velocity method, which is these red circles here, well, they're very adept at finding different types of planets again. So these are long period planets here. You can see a thousand days, so that's three years or so it takes for them to orbit their parent star, but again, massive ones as well. But we've also got a new cluster down here. This has sort of changed in recent years where with transits, although they're very short period, they're also kind of getting towards, you know, verging on more Earth-like, so much smaller ones. But yeah, by far the most prolific are transit, radial velocity, micro lensing and imaging. There are a couple more listed on this plot here, but only a few have been found like that so far. And these exoplanets, in terms of where they are on the sky, well, actually, they're kind of scattered everywhere. So this is a plot that was made. It's actually a wonderful video. You can head to YouTube after the talk and look it up. It sort of shows um, over time where all these exoplanets have been found. And they are scattered over the sky, but we can see here um, in the sort of top left, there's this great big cluster of them here in this. It's hard to see, but it is actually cross shape. This is actually in the constellation of Cygnus, the swan. And this is because this is where the Kepler Space Telescope, which we'll come to later, stared at this patch of sky 
and um, found thousands and thousands of exoplanets. It stayed here for four or five years. And then we can see there's others scattered across the sky. Um, there's a little bit more of a cluster across here because this is where Kepler went um, along this line here after it um, had finished its primary mission, which was this one. And this U shape here, this is just our galaxy and it's the night sky has been stretched out into a rectangle so we can kind of see it. This is the centre of our galaxy here and then stretching out along the sides there. But yeah, exoplanets, they're found everywhere. They, there's no you know, reason that they're not in one patch of sky compared to the other particularly. They seem to be found everywhere. And of course, there, we can't talk about all of them, you know, all four and a half thousand of them, but there are a few that we can definitely mention. Um, one that always gets brought up is Kepler 16b, named so because it was discovered by the um, Kepler Space Telescope and 16 because it was the 16th one. And then the B just denotes that it's a planet. That's how we name planets. We go B, C, D, E and so on. This one is often referred to as the real life Tatooine, as it were, um, because it orbits two stars much like Tatooine from Star Wars, and that's what this planet does. We think it's got mass similar to Saturn, takes 230 days or so to complete an orbit. And in terms of old exoplanets, there's one that we found um, orbiting a pulsar again. So again, this is the same artist's impression. It's sometimes referred to as the Methuselah or Genesis planet. And we believe that this planet is 12.7 billion years old. So that is only about a billion years younger than the entire universe, which is astonishing. And really it's astonishing that it survived going, its star going supernova. So it you know, survived around the, its pulsar. Going the other way in terms of ones which don't have much time left, we've got WASP-12b and um, this, orbits its parent star extraordinarily close, so close that it reaches temperatures of 2000 degrees Celsius and actually might be evaporating. That's why we think it's only got about 10 million years left because we think it's just been superheated so much it's losing its atmosphere and its parent star is kind of absorbing it all onto itself. At the other end of the scale, in terms of planets which are really far away from their parent star, we've got uh, not very exotically named HD 106906b, and it orbits its parent star 650 times further away than the Earth does around the Sun. So the star is in the middle here. This is a real image of the system. So the star would be in the middle here. Its light has been blocked out so that we can see the planet. And that dot there is the planet itself and you know 11 times the size of Jupiter it's sort of it's almost a failed star almost and then of course we can go to something that's very nearby actually and this is the closest exoplanet to us because it is orbiting the closest star to the sun so that is Proxima Centauri b about four light years away takes about 11 days to orbit or so and very excitingly, we think it's roughly Earth-sized and it could be rocky. And that is a very exciting prospect that the nearest star to the sun has a small rocky planet orbiting it. And if we're talking about exciting rocky planets, we absolutely have to mention the TRAPPIST-1 system. So this system is about 40 light years away from Earth. Again, not a terrible distance. And this is a remarkable system of seven rocky exoplanets and reasonably Earth-like. So in these pictures, um, we've got the planets, the inner planets of our solar system. They are to scale with what we think the TRAPPIST-1 system planets look like. And just take a moment to look at the, the size comparison. Like they are, like so many of them are so similar in size. that we found this kind of multiple system of rocky planets and then we've sort of got artist impressions of what it looks might look like on the surface of these planets some of them might have water some of them might not so we know about all these planets we know that there's this huge variety of them and we know that there's lots of them but how do we find them now, for the, the sake of time, we can't go through all the detection methods, so we're not going to discuss microlensing and we're not going to discuss radial velocity. 
We're just going to do transit and imaging because who doesn't want to see pictures of actual exoplanets? And then the transit method is our most prolific method. So we'll talk about that one. So direct imaging, one of the ways that we find exoplanets is by physically seeing them. So we've got an animation here of um, Beta Pictoris B, and this is actual data. This is an actual picture of the planet orbiting its star. So the way we're looking at it, the light from the star is being blocked out. It's that big black circle that you can see on the left. And then you can imagine that the planet is orbiting around the star, so it's going to disappear behind the star from our point of view. But those pixels, those few bright pixels, are actual pictures of the exoplanet. It's a big one, 13 times the mass of Jupiter, so we're on the verge of kind of failed stars territory. We think it takes about 20 years or so to orbit. Another very exciting system is HR 8799, and this is a multi-planet system that we've actually managed to image. So again, the light from the star has been blocked out in the centre, and you can see that there's four dots kind of moving around in this image over time. There's a time counter in the bottom left, and that tracks over the six or seven years or so. But those dots are actual planets moving about in their orbit. So this solar system, as we're looking at it, is kind of in the plane of the page. So you can imagine the planets kind of moving around like this. Not a very old system, quite young, actually. Um, and, you know, they, they take different amounts of time to orbit their parent star between 40 years and 400 years. And I think that this is just astonishing that we can actually see planets orbiting their host star. So when we are looking for planets, we often do this using infrared light. So that is light that's invisible to the human eye. And that's because in the infrared, planets are brighter compared to their host star. So host stars usually emit most of their light in the visible range, or if they're very, very hot, they'll emit a lot of UV light as well. But in the infrared, they're dimmer compared to the planets, which because of the temperature of the planets, they emit most of their light in the infrared, just kind of as humans do. Direct imaging is great because it gives us lots of detail on the orbits of the planets, you know, we can refine it quite well. We can also actually detect the light from the planets itself, so we can get a little bit of information, perhaps, if what they're, of what they're made of or things like that. But it is biased towards planets which are orbiting very far away from their star, of course. The planets which are very close to their parent star, we just can't see them because they're lost in the glare of the star itself. And naturally, it's extraordinarily difficult. You know, you need a big, bright planet. You need to stare at these stars for a very long time, but they're not too long so that you don't oversaturate the sensor from the light of the planet. So it's difficult to do, but when we can do it, it's absolutely fantastic. So moving on to the second method that we're going to discuss, and that is the transit method. This is the, the way most exoplanet hunting uh, telescopes will work. And what we do is monitor a star and just stare at it for a long time. And we watch a dip in its light out. And, and we get three, that's generally the number I'm trying to go for, three pieces of very similar dip dips. That's the analysis of the planet that we're seeing. Now, it could be, you know, you might get a dip in the light um, from a you might get a dip in the light from a sunspot, for example, um, or something like that. Maybe a cloud of dust moves in front of the star. But if you get three consecutive similar dips, then that tells us um, that it is a planet. And with this method, we can calculate orbital period and we can calculate the size of the planet as well. And that's always very interesting. Different shapes of transit tell us different things. things. So, for example, uh, if you have a smaller star transiting in front of the planet, so passing in front of the, uh, in front of the star, as we do it with Earth, like in this animation, a smaller planet will give us a smaller dip compared to a large planet, which will give us a much bigger dip, dropping the light out of a star. And then and also so the sort of width of the dip, dip that then tells about, about the size of the star, star actually. actually. So, so, you know, so you know, if a planet, planet is transiting a very, very big star, star then they'll get, get that a much bigger wide dip, dip, dip with the world of planet is transiting a smaller star, star like, like in this picture, picture on the left. Now, now, 
the big question is how much light is 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 lost? How much are we talking about when a planet passes in front of it? So that's about that. On the screen in front of you, there are um, four squares. And I think one of these four squares is two percent more translucent than the others. And two percent is a very generous amount of light lost by a planet passing in front of a total star, as seen um, from Earth. And more often than not, it's much less than that. Now, now I, don't I don't know, know if anyone wants to in the chat maybe has a guess at which, which of these these four. I'll have, have a little bit of a chat now, now. Um, um, and just, just see what's, what's coming, coming through. through. We've, We've got, got seven, seven, four, 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 one far left, left one, one, one far right, right. Uh, three, 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 one, two, one, one, two, 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 uh, maybe a bit of a consensus for the, for the first. I, I can I see, see a lot of numbers and reasons popular. And then it's actually the first one. one. So, so congratulations, congratulations if you said the first one. one. But I hope that they can have a look in the chat and you'll see that actually there's a, there's a pretty even distribution of what one of them is guessing. Um, and so I hope that gives you an idea of, of just how difficult this method is when you're trying to find planets. The amount of light that we're blocking out is minuscule. It's the equivalent of a of a gnat passing in front of a car headlight, you know, to the human eye imperceptible, but to our senses, it's something that we can actually detect. So the transit method, as we've established, is an extraordinarily successful way to find planets, as you know, the numbers tell the story. It can be done from the ground or in space. So that's great. You know, we don't have to always have a space telescope to do this. We can do it from the ground. But a big limitation of the transit method is you have to have the system aligned properly. So in this diagram here on the right, you have to be able to see that planet moving in front of the star. So if the systems are aligned edge on, as it were to us, like we can see it, we can, we can see the dimming. Whereas if the planet is orbiting, sort of if you imagine going around the edge of the screen, as it were, so in the bottom, we can't see it. So not every solar system out there is gonna be detectable using this method. And of course, it is biased towards big planets orbiting close to their parent star, big planets because they block out more of the star's light, and then close to their parent star because we get these three dips regularly. And we need that repetition of the dips in order to identify Okay, I'm back, I think. I think I'm back. All right. You are. So I am. Okay, good. So the um, by far the most successful which operated its and then did an extended mission until 2014 where it mapped along the ecliptic which is the path that the planets seem to take across the sky um, during the course of a year. It you know, studies over half a million stars during its lifetime um, 2,800 exoplanets have been confirmed by the Kepler Space Telescope. There's another 3,000 waiting to be confirmed that they exist. And the biggest take home from the Kepler Space Telescope was that on average, every star hosts at least one planet. TESS um, is another um, transiting exoplanet um, telescope. In fact, that's what TESS stands for, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And this one, though, instead of staring at that small patch of sky in Cygnus, it had a look across the sky and focus on the bright stars, which are close to the sun, which are scattered all across the sky. So far, 155 exoplanets have been confirmed since this mission finished just over a year ago, well, its primary mission finished just over a year ago. And there's four and a half thousand candidates waiting to be confirmed, but it's now on to its secondary mission and is expected to find even more. And part of its sort of object objective was to find a list of targets for the James Webb Space Telescope, which should be launched in December, we hope, to go and study that. And James Webb will be able to do 
the future of exoplanets, which is not so much about finding exoplanets because we found thousands of them, but it's about characterizing them. So their mass, their size, we can then work out their density. Can we work out what their atmosphere is made of? Do they have liquid water? Are there biosignatures in the atmosphere? That's the kind of future of this field. So Cheops or Cheeps or Cheops, I've heard it pronounced every which way, that's up there now doing that, characterising the atmospheres of exoplanets. JWST will be doing it. We also have um, Twinkle, which will come in 2024, and Ariel in 2028. And that's what these guys will all be doing, all of them space telescopes. But now we move on to the kind of final part of the talk. And... Um, we know about all these exoplanets, right? But the real question that's always on everyone's lips is, is there life out on these planets? And you're gonna hate me, but it's audience participation time, which I know is gonna make lots of you kind of look like this, but trust me, go with it. It's gonna be really fun as long as my internet connection holds up, but we'll, we'll muddle through. If not, I'll call on Tracy to pick. So it's not like a quiz, it's not question and answers, it's just a poll and then we're going to go with majority rules and the website that you need to go to is up in the right hand corner of the slides, you just need to put the etc.ch forward slash bit in. Um, that's going to remain in the corner of the slides now for a while, you don't need to go there for the next slide, you've got sort of five minutes or so to get yourself on there, just do it on your phone, it, it should work. Okay. So, you know, it's all the way through popular culture, right? It's everywhere. Contact, films, War of the Worlds, Alien vs. Predator, Doctor Who, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the Marvel Universe. It all functions on kind of life out there in our galaxy somewhere. But the real question is, what are the odds of finding an alien species out there? What are the odds of them actually existing? And guess what? It's astronomy, right? So there's an equation for that. And don't get intimidated. Some of you might be kind of horrified at the mention of an equation. But this is why we have the poll and we're going to go through it together. We're going to have a lot of fun doing it. So before we get to the equation, we want to talk about the guy who invented the equation. This guy here, Frank Drake, American astronomer and astrophysicist, helped found SETI. He's actually the brains behind the Arecibo message. So that is the Arecibo message here. Um, on the right, this was a powerful radio message that was sent into deep space. It was sent to uh, M13, which is a globular cluster, 25,000 light years away. And it was sort of being towards the cluster. So the idea is if there are any kind of planets out there that have intelligent civilizations that could pick up the signal they they would then know that oh well at least there was someone out there 25,000 years ago and the Arecibo message encodes all sorts of different things so it's numbers um we've got um different chemicals um which are all to do with life we've got a strand of DNA um the size of a person what a human looks like the population of the earth at the time this, the yellow here, is a representation of the solar system, and this here is, is the dish. So it encodes lots and lots of different things, just, you know, hopefully that any alien will be able to figure out that it came from a civilization and that intended that message to go out. And when he was um, at a meeting of the American Astronomical Association, he kind of came up with this equation which is now referred to as the Drake equation. It's all about using probability to estimate the number of advanced extraterrestrial civilizations out there that could communicate with us. And it wasn't kind of like, it's, it's not hard facts, right? It's just something to generate a conversation. And that's why I thought it'd be really great to end this talk on this. So this is the basic version of the Drake equation. There's lots and lots of different versions out there. This is the one that we're going to do because it's nice and short and sweet. And you are going to need to head to that website very soon. So in order to estimate the number of technological advanced civilizations in the Milky Way, we have to consider a few things. And Drake decided these were the factors that mattered the most. First of all, the rate of star formation of stars in the galaxy. So how often this galaxy is forming new stars, because, you know, 
you want new stars to be forming and forming planets all the time so that um the sort of as stars die out they replenish you've got this constant you know chance of planets being able to form around stars we then consider how many of those stars in the galaxy have planets around them we then consider how many planets per star per solar system have an environment that's suitable for life so not necessarily has life but is suitable for life life could live there then we consider the fraction of suitable planets on which life actually appears so of all the habitable planets how many of them then actually get life we then consider the fraction of planets which have life how many of them then get intelligent life so how many of them go from bacteria to something intelligent and then of the intelligent life that exists how many of those intelligent civilizations develop a technology that's sort of broadcastable into space and detectable by someone else and then the final consideration is how long does a civilization last so we're going to go through these one by one and we're going to do some maths and come up with an answer for how many technologically advanced civilizations we think as a group are out in our galaxy. So the first term of the Drake equation, the rate of self formation in the galaxy, this one we're just going to take as a number. So we are going to go for one, about one star like um, sun like star a year is roughly the self formation rate um, in our galaxy. And when you're kind of considering this number, you also have to think about what stars are going to be suitable for life. The massive ones, which only live for millions of years, probably not. Things like pulsars, where they have these enormously powerful radiation beams that could be sweeping across the planets all the time, probably not. Also, stars which are very unstable and flaring a lot. So, you know, the sun, we know, releases flares, it expels enormous amounts of material. It gives us beautiful aurora on Earth. But if you're having that happen all the time and you're being bathed in this sort of sterilizing UV, UV radiation all the time, that, that is no good for life. So for our galaxy, we're going to take the number to be about one. And so now you are going to need to be on that link, hopefully. And I'm going to check that it works on my phone because I've uh, logged into it and I am going to start. So hopefully, yes, that should be working. So the first one is what fraction of stars have planets? Now, according to the Kepler Space Telescope, which is found 2,600 exoplanets, we think that every star on average hosts a planet. The Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite is expected to find about 10,000 planets by studying 200,000 stars. So if we consider tests, maybe that means not, not every star has a planet. But remember, these telescopes are not going to be able to see every planet. So what do we think? Oh, sorry, folks. Um, we've got 5%, 20%, 50%, 100%. Lots of you are voting like mad and I wish I could share the, the live view with you, but we tried it earlier and it wouldn't work, unfortunately. So you're going to have to trust that I'm not lying when we go with the majority. Um, but yeah, OK, so we've most people who are participating have voted. So you have gone for collectively uh, answer D, which is every every star has a planet. And if it was me picking, I would also go with that. You're back. I'm back. You are. Okay. I'm just going to re. Okay. I hope that this is still going. So, yeah, it is. It's still clocking up. So, that's where we're going. We're going with answer D that every single star has a planet around it. Good. Okay. So, we're going to move on to the next question now. And this is how many planets could support life? Now, this is not how many have life, how many could support life? And when we think about how many could support life, we have to think about the habitable zone. That is kind of our best description at the minute of what, you know, what could be supporting life. So the habitable zone varies depending on the type of star that you're orbiting. So, um, for example, 
if it's a smaller, cooler star, then the habitable zone is much closer in compared to a very hot, bright star, that habitable zone is going to be further out. And by habitable zone, we mean the region around the star where water can exist in all three states. So it's not necessarily just about it being liquid, but about existing in all three states. Now, in our solar system, depends who you ask, we've got two or three planets in the habitable zone. Earth, of course. Um, this diagram here includes Mars and there's another one here which includes, uh, includes Venus pretty much, it's kind of on the border. And as far as we know so far, Earth is the only one that has life, but for our solar system we would say that there's kind of two or three actually that could support life. So I'll move on to the next question now and vote away. How many planet, how many planets do you think in the galaxy when we're considering all of the stars in the galaxy, how many planets could support life? So not have life, but could be. So in our solar system, we might say, yeah, Venus, Earth, Mars, I would go for three. In the Kepler 62 system, we think, for example, that there could be two that are kind of in this habitable zone. They're, they could have liquid water, which makes them possibly support in life. So we are almost up to the number of that was similar last time and there is an outstanding winner. So you guys have collectively voted for C, which is two. So I will make a note of that and then we will move on to and I will vote what you guys vote as the average and then we will move on to the next question. Okay, so the next term in the Drake equation is now we, ha we have to think across the galaxy for this one. So of all the planets in the galaxy, which could support life, you know, they've got liquid water, well, they're in the region where they could be liquid water. How many of those actually have life? What, what kind of percentage of those do you think actually have life? Now, now when we say life, when we mean any, any sort of life, like right, bacteria, and you know, we, we only know one sort of example, example of life that's, that's here on Earth. Earth formed four and a half billion years ago, and our oldest known fossil is three and a half billion years old. Um, we know that the building blocks of life, so the building blocks of where life built comes from, they're common, it's found in comets, but we do find the building blocks of life out there in clouds of gas and dust in space. Did we find out that of life like Venus last year? Mm. You're back. I'm back. I'm back. Okay, so did we find out that for life on Venus? Mm, maybe, because we found that on Venus, which was argued to be a bio signature. Mm, debates out on that. So, you know, of the planets which can support life, how many of them actually have life? So in our solar system, if you say that only Earth is habitable, then we've got 100%. Whereas if you said, well, actually, I think there's three in the habitable zone of our solar system and we've only got one of those three that has life, then you would say it's 33%. So that's the sort of way we're thinking about it. You're with us. Okay, so that's the way that we're thinking about this, is of the planets which could support life, how many of them actually have life? We're thinking across the galaxy. So, vote away. These are your options. I will bring them up. So, 1% would be saying that, nah, only a, only a fraction, a really tiny amount of the ones that could, theoretically, they're in the habitable zone, they could have life. Just a tiny amount of them. If you're going for 50 or 100%, you're saying that, yeah, I think if you're in the habitable zone, then yeah, you can have life. So we're getting close to the number of people who voted in the other ones. And this is a lot closer, actually. Ooh. No, we're okay. I think we're stopping. So collectively, you guys have gone for B, which would be 10%. So we're, we're not very hopeful for um, if they can technically, you know, they could. They're in the habitable zone. 
not many of them, only about 10% of them actually have allies. Great, okay. So now we move on to uh, all the planets that have life. So we're now considering a planet that has life, like considering Earth, for example. What fraction of them have intelligent life? Now, this is a very interesting question, because what do we mean by intelligent life, right? right. right. Think about all of the species on the Earth, you know, yeah. there's millions of different species. What do we class as intelligent, right? Humans? I don't think humans are very intelligent. We're destroying the planet that we live on. I think we're actually really stupid, is it? But then would we consider apes as intelligent life? You know, they, they have the ability to use tools. What about... You're back. I'm back. Okay. We know that dolphins have very, very sophisticated sort of family lives and everything. Um, so maybe you would consider that Earth does have intelligent life. The only example of life that we have has evolved intelligent life. So do you agree with that statement? Let's move on to the next question. Uh, there we go. Of the planets, what fraction actually have intelligent life? So do we think that actually most of them are just going to remain at bacteria level and only a tiny percent will in, in develop intelligent life? Or do we think that, well, once, back, once life evolves, that's it, it will inevitably end up somewhere intelligent? Or do we not even know what intelligent life is? So, oh, we are terribly pessimistic oh i wish you could see this bar chart a very everyone's voted one percent well 60 percent of you have gone for one percent so that's i mean look it, it's it's your galaxy fair enough we're i well yeah you seem to agree with me that actually there isn't any intelligent life out there because we certainly aren't okay moving on to the next term so now we're thinking about the intelligent life and civilizations that develop what fraction developed technology that could be used to sort of reveal their presence? So when we think about this, we have to think, well, what sort of technology are we talking about? You know, telescopes, we need detectors um, in order, and we need to sort of be able to beam that information out into space. You need to develop electricity. You know, we, we think about like, well, I, I've said on the slide Britain, but the entire world a hundred years ago, you know, we didn't have this sort of capability. We just about invented electricity. Um, in terms of broadcasting signals into deep space, the first time we did this on purpose was about 45 years ago with the Arecibo message. But, um, you know, we've been doing it for a couple of decades prior to the Arecibo message, inadvertently transmitting all of our radio and TV gumph into deep space. But then maybe actually this talks about technology. You're back. I'm back. Right. So maybe this talks about technology that we haven't even invented yet. So there are your numbers. I'll move it on to the next question and that should be live for you now. So we've got to intelligent life. Intelligent life exists on our planet in the galaxy. Do we think that this intelligent life will develop technology to reveal its presence? 1%, no, we're sticking with sort of dolphins and apes. They're not getting technology. 100%, yes, if we develop um you know intelligent life they will eventually get to technology if the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out we would have had little lizard people running around with their telescopes considering the very same topics that we were considering oh and it's so close between a and b so get your votes in if anyone else is is going to vote oh my gosh it's actually a tie you won't believe me but A and B are tied at 34.3% each. Um, and, oh, no, A is just right. I'm going to stop this now. A has just pipped it. You guys are so pessimistic. So we're going for 0.01% 0 .01, uh, 1 option A. Okay, so we're almost at the end of the equation. And the final bit is, so we're presuming that even though you guys don't think it, we are presuming that eventually we got to a civilization which could kind of beam itself out into space and sort of scream into the void that they exist. 
So then we have to consider how long do these civilizations release detectable signals into space? But to think, you know, for us, we've been doing it on purpose, you know, 45, 50 years since the Arecibo message. But then really, I think this is a question of how long does a civilization last? Okay. Now on the earth, the Roman Empire asked, lasted for 2000 years. The first Egyptian civilization was 500 years. Are we inevitably going to nuke ourselves into oblivion in 50 years time? Are we just going to, you know, global warming's going to catch up with us and actually we're all going to be gone in the next 100 years? Is there going to be some sort of natural disaster tomorrow that we can't control, just like the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs? Or now that civilization has gotten to this point where we can beam into deep space, are we finally at a turning point where actually civilization will continue forever? Now that we have modern technology, this is it. This is how it's going to be for millions of years. So these are the options that I've given you. Of course, if you want to do this equation again when you get home, um, just going to turn it onto the one so that you can vote. Um, you know, you can put whatever numbers you in you you want to into the. I've just had to, you know, pick uh, some numbers for you guys to go for. So numbers coming in. Oh, you are all terribly pessimistic. I wish you could see this bar chart moving up. Um, we're getting close to the number that have voted on the others and so yeah if you haven't voted yet have, have a little chat with your friend or whoever okay so we're we're at about the same number as before and you guys have gone for b option b which is five thousand years so what we do now is because it's never a good idea to try and do live maths using your brain unless you're on countdown and you're extremely clever, but I'm just going to, in my um, calculator, put in all of these numbers that you guys have chosen. So, and I will tell you the grand total <laughs> of civilizations that we have, you guys have come up with, and you have come up with, a grand total of 0 0.1, which means there are no technologically advanced civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. That's what you're saying with an answer of less than one. Your final answer was 0 0.1 by my calculations. Now, Frank Drake, he's actually pretty much agree with you. When he initially did this, he came up with an answer of 10. Um, so he was pretty pessimistic as well. And when we consider, uh, you know, all the billions, hundreds, billions of stars that there are in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, there's about 400 billion or so stars in our galaxy. For only 10 of them to have an intelligent civilization, oh, well, that's not too great. Now, the very great Carl Sagan, um, depending on what he considers, he came up with anything between 10 and 1 million of the 400 billion stars in our galaxy. And Professor Stephen Eels was just my PhD supervisor. So I thought it would be fun to put his numbers in. And he was a lot more optimistic. He went from anything from 25,000 technologically advanced civilizations all the way through to 50,000 million or 50 billion. So we have now reached the end of the talk. Thank you guys for sticking with me. And I hope you enjoyed it. I just kind of want to leave you with this quote from Vincent van Gogh. And this one always kind of sticks with me whenever we think about, you know, life elsewhere, aliens and, you know, exoplanets. And he said, for my part, I know nothing with any certainty, but the sight of the stars makes me dream. And I think what we've proven in this talk is that we really don't know if there is life elsewhere. We have no idea, um, but we can have a lot of fun by thinking about it. So I will leave my details up there. And that is the end. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. And I was, it was quite tense toward the end. I'm like, oh my God, what are we going to get? What's our answer? <laughs> <laughs> and then to just be like, no, we don't exist. That's it. Yeah, We're done. That's it. You guys are so <laughs> pessimistic. There's, there's no, it's really interesting. I've done this a few times and sometimes you've come up with like, you know, 20,000 technologically advanced civilizations. And it's like, oh, maybe one of them will contact us. But 
no, you guys decided, no, there's, and you know what? Maybe I agree with you, but <laughs> there are no technologically advanced civilizations out there. Well, clearly, you know, as students of science, we've all been doing a bit of research and we, you know, we're edging on the side of caution and yeah, yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, if anybody wants to take a quick photo of um, Jenny's screenshot so you can see her or her links and stuff, please do. Um, once you stop sharing, if you didn't get the links, let us know and we'll get them sent to you. But we're going to go into questions and answers now. So, um, we're going to stop the recording if you can do that for me please Annette